My name is Professor Carol Tan. I'm the head of the School of Law here. Um, many of our students studying law, at particularly those at postgraduate level, are interested in issues of human rights and international law, inequality and social justice. So again, as, as Andrea said, this is our focus is Asia, Africa and the Middle East. But we of course realize that these themes permeate so much of the world outside of those regions. So it's entirely appropriate that we have a debate on Nicaragua this evening. So this evening, I'm going to first introduce our two speakers, and then each of them is going to speak, after which there will be a little bit of time for questions. We are restricted by the room booking, so we have to be out of here by 7 p.m., I'm afraid. So without further, ado, um, further uh, delay, our first speaker is Bianca Jagger. Bianca has dedicated her life to campaigning for human rights, civil liberties, peace, social justice, and environmental protection throughout the world. She was born in Managua, Nicaragua. She left her native country to study political science in Paris with a scholarship from the French government. In 2005, she founded the Bianca Jagger Human Rights Foundation, and she is Council of Europe Goodwill Ambassador a member of the Executive Director's Leadership Council for Amnesty International USA and ICU, IUCN Bond Challenge Ambassador. Bianca Jagger is the recipient of numerous prestigious awards, including the Right Livelihood Award, also known as the Alternative Nobel Prize, the United Nations Earth Day International Award, the Amnesty International USA Media Spotlight Award for Leadership, and the American Civil Liberties Union Award, amongst other awards. Ms. Jagger has been awarded four doctorates, a doctorate of human rights from Roehampton University, um, one in law from the University of East London, one in human rights from Simmons College, Boston, and a doctorate of humanities from Stonehill College, Massachusetts. Our second speaker this evening is Felix Maradiaga. He is a Nicaraguan academic and social entrepreneur, currently recognized as one of the main opposition voices to the Ortega regime. After serving as Secretary General for Nicaragua's Ministry of Defense between the years 2002 and 2006, Felix dedicated himself to strengthening peace, democracy, and the rule of law in his country. He is currently director of the Institute of Strategic Studies and Public Policies, one of the top think tanks in Latin America, and has previously led several civil society organizations. He is widely published on Central American affairs and holds a degree in public administration from the Harvard Kennedy School and also um, um, in renewable en energy engineering from the University of Barcelona. Felix is a member of the World Economic Forum and the Aspen Global Leaders Network. In 2016, Forbes magazine named him as one of Central America's most influential people. Welcome, both of you. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. I would like to thank Baroness Helena Kennedy, who is here today. It is a pleasure for us to have her. And, um, and to all you friends and friends from Nicaragua who are accompanying us as well. I'd like to thank SOAS for giving me the opportunity to organize this symposium. Thank you very much. It really means a lot to us. I don't know how much you all know about what is happening in Nicaragua. But the first things that I can tell you is that 
once upon a time, 39 years ago, I supported the Sandinista revolution. And I, like thousands of millions of people throughout the world, believe that the Sandinista revolution was the answer for the developing world. And therefore, one of the reasons why I feel so strongly about what is happening in Nicaragua today is because I feel betrayed. I feel betrayed by a man who was regarded by many as a revolutionary leader who today is a murderous dictator. The brutal repression of Daniel Ortega's regime against the unarmed population during the last seven months has resulted in more than 500 extrajudicial executions, almost 4,000 wounded, hundreds of missing people, more than 600 prisoners charged with false accusations, and the use of unspeakable torture. This strategy of repression and crimes against humanity prompted members of the US Congress to propose the Bill of Law S-3233, Human Right and Anti-Corruption Law of Nicaragua of 2000, 2018. The law was approved unanimously in the Senate on November 27, 2018. Ortega has declared a war on the civilian population of Nicaragua. He has declared a war on students, on poor farmers, or what we call campesinos, on workers, on journalists, on human rights defenders, on medical personnel because they refuse to accept that they shouldn't treat the wounded the people or the students or anyone who was wounded who was protested. And he's even persecuting the church. I will tell you a little bit about why as well I feel so strongly. I was in Nicaragua in May and June and I went to Nicaragua, I have been to Nicaragua twice with Amnesty International, with whom I work very closely. And I didn't begin my um, denouncing Daniel Ortega seven months ago. I began denouncing Daniel Ortega the moment I knew that Daniel Ortega had abused sexually his stepdaughter, Soil America, who was, as she says, nine years old at the time. So in 2017, I went with Amnesty International to release a report called Rights for Sale. That report was denouncing the project for an interoceanic canal that would have been an environmental crime. And when I was there, I went to very remote areas of Nicaragua and marched with the poor farmers who had been marching for three years at least, and who had been persecuted by Daniel Ortega. But because there were the farmers, the poor farmers, and because people in the city don't really pay much attention to what happened to farmers and to poor farmers in particular, not just in Nicaragua, but in many parts of the world. And, uh, and, I, um, and I was able really to realize the um, persecution that they were victims of. Then this year, in May, I went with Amnesty International again to release a report called Shoot to Kill. And this report, if you haven't seen it, is very important because what it shows and what it reported was that Daniel Ortega policy was not just to harm or to use um, bullets that wouldn't kill 
but really to kill the students who began to demonstrate sometime in April, the April 19 of this year. And then later on, I went, uh, and while I was there, I was able to visit the students who were barricading themselves in universities and visited a university called the Yunnan. And that's where I met some of the students who are today in jail. One of them is called Levi Rugama Artola, and the other one is called Janitza and Victoria. And I got to know these kids and to see their, their desire to live in a Nicaragua where there was democracy, justice, and freedom. And every time I think about when I am campaigning, and I campaign tirelessly to get sanctions against the government, I campaign to get the students and all the political prisoners who are um, at least more than 600 in Nicaragua today to be released and to denounce the crimes against humanity that are being perpetrated by Daniel Ortega. The brutal repression of Daniel Ortega's regime against the unarmed population during the last seven months has resulted in more than 500 extrajudicial executions, as I said before, almost 4,000 wounded, hundreds of missing people, more than 600 prisoners charged with four accusations, and the use of unspeakable torture. The strategy of repression and crimes against humanity, uh, as I said, had prompted Congress in the US to impose sanctions, but there are other countries, and I, we are hoping and we are campaigning to get the European Union as well to impose sanctions on Nicaragua. The five, the six students of which I've been talking to you, I'd mentioned three. Uh, there is as well Byron Estrada Correa, Leon Christopher Nairobi Olivas, and Leon Juan Pablo Alvarado Martinez, and Yaritza, and Levis, and Victoria, as I mentioned. We're supposed to have a trial a few days ago. That trial has been postponed for Monday. International Human Rights Day. I will be in Scotland in Parliament is speaking about human rights. And you can be sure that I will be speaking about the students and all the other students who are in jail and who have been assassinated. There are 50 students who are in jail with that they have been already charged. There is 150 who have not been charged and there is 70 students who have been killed in Nicaragua. But it's not only students who have been killed. Daniel Ortega has killed more than 23 children under the age of 18, some as young as two years old. I was wondering what I could tell you when I was going to speak to you. And I think that one of the things that a lot of people in the left have not understood is why a revolutionary leader has become a dictator. Well, it didn't happen overnight. It took 39 years to develop. As you may know, the people of Nicaragua led by the Sandinista Liberation Front, the FSLN, overthrew Anastasio Somoza, the last dictator of the dynasty in 1979. The Somozas ruled from 1936 to 1979 with the support of the US. During these years, they consolidated their power using corruption, tyranny, and repression. They used a strategy of systematic and serious violations of human rights. Extrajudicial executions, torture, intimidations, and censorship of the press. These are exactly the same method 
that have been used today by Daniel Ortega against the unarmed population in Nicaragua. In just one more thing that I must tell you is the persecution that is taking place as we speak against the media in Nicaragua. It is not only all of those people that I mentioned, but members of the media, of the independent media in Nicaragua, are being put in jail, are being forced to flee the country. And today in Nicaragua, there are 53,000 people that we know that have fled to the neighboring countries, that have fled to Costa Rica, and that have fled to Honduras. Daniel Ortega was one of the nine comandantes. No one could have has suspected that he will end up becoming another murderous dictator 39 years later. Ortega assumed the position of coordinator of the five persons Junta Nacional de Reconstrucción, which was composed of him, of Sergio Ramirez as vice president, Moises Hassan Morales, Alfonso Robelo, and Violeta Barrio de Chamorro, who later on became president of Nicaragua. Within a year, Alfonso Robelo and Violeta Chamorro resigned from the position when they realized that they did not have any real power. They were replaced by Arturo Cruz, Rafael Cordova Rivas, and in July, the US pressured the FSLN to broaden the junta and the other three additional members. In 1984, Ortega was elected president for six years, for a six year period, while the country was torn by the Contra war financed by the US. And let me tell you, I campaign against the Contra war because I have always opposed any foreign intervention in Nicaragua, a position that I continue to have today. And some of you will say, well, but Congress has passed a bill that will impose sanctions on Nicaragua. That is a very different thing than invading and financing a contra war against the people of Nicaragua. In 1990 to 1996, as part of the Esquipulas Peace Accord, Ortega and the FSLN called for an early presidential election. Perhaps this were the only uh, honest uh, elections in Nicaragua, in Nicaragua's history. They took place with international observers from the Carter Center, along with the United Nations and the OAS, and with external funding for the opposition. I was a witness. I was um, an observer to this election. To everyone's surprise, not to mine, Violeta Barrios de Chamorro won the election. The FSLN remained the most powerful, at that time, most powerful political power with control over the army, the police, and the unions. After his defeat, Ortega pronounced his famous phrase, I will govern from below and used his social and political forces to destabilize the Chamorro government with the strikes, demonstrations, and repeated calls for the revolutionary reconstruction of the Nicaraguan society. Daniel Ortega directed La Piñata. This was, for many of us who had supported this revolution, the call to realize that this was not the kind of revolutionary leader that we have expected them to be. La Piñata was a full-scale privatization of state properties that passed into the personal hands of the FSLN leadership. This marked the first chapter of the ethical suicide of the FSLN. The Sandinista lost their moral authority. In 1996, Ortega lost the presidential election to Arnoldo Aleman, named by Transparency International as the ninth most corrupt leader in recent history. In 2001, in 2006, to 2006, Ortega once again lost the presidential election, this time against Enrique Bolaños. And a triangle began to be developed 
between Alemán, Bolaños, and Ortega. During his presidency, Bolaños initiated an investigation of Arnoldo Alemán, and in December of 2003 and of two, he was formally charged with money, laundry, embellishment, and corruption. And in December 2003, he was sentenced to 20 years prison term. Between 1990 and 2007, Daniel Ortega manipulated the legal institution, organized general strikes, and he made the government ungovernable. This marked the second chapter in Ortega's suicide, ethical suicide. In fact, many left the ranks of the Sandinista Front, claiming it was no longer Sandinismo. From now on, it was Orteguismo, centered around one person and a close circle. The pact, I think that one of the things that is more important for people to understand is how did Daniel Ortega consolidated his power? What were the pact that he struck through those years that allowed him to become who he is today? In 1998, Ortega began negotiations with Arnoldo Aleman. In 1999, the agreement between then materialized into the constitutional reforms of the electoral law that were implemented in 2000. During this period, it was when Daniel Ortega um, began to uh, soil America, uh, denounce that he had abused her. And for his sexual abuse from the age of nine. But what is very interesting to note is that her mother, Rosario Murillo, deserted her daughter and stood behind Daniel Ortega, which will explain to you why Rosario Murillo is today the vice president of the country. From 1996 to 2001, Arnoldo Lemand, with the support of Daniel Ortega, enacted neoliberal policies. He privatized health care, education, and social security. In 2006, the pact allowed Daniel Ortega to win the elections with 38% of the vote, thanks to the constitutional change agreed with Arnoldo Aleman. This modification of the electoral um, rules for presidential election reduced the threshold to win the presidency in the first round from 45 to 35 percent of the vote. A few months before the elections, Daniel Ortega and the parliamentary group of the FSLN supported the adoption of a law that will prohibit abortion even in cases of rape. The legislation repealed the law that had been in place since the presidency of President Zelaya in 1893. The legislation took effect on July 2008 under Ortega presidency. 2007 to 2011, Daniel Ortega assumed the president in January of 2007. In 2009, the Supreme Court revoked Arnoldo Aleman's sentence of 20 years in prison. This was the result of a secret pact between Aleman and Ortega, who has considerable influence over the court, if not total um, control of the court. Ortega dismantled all legal institutions. He proceeded to centralize power, achieving control over the executive, the legislative, the judiciary, the Supreme Court, the Supreme Electoral Court, and in addition to that, the municipalities and universities. In 2011, Ortega and constitutional re-election, the Nicaraguan constitution prohibited a candidate for president to run for co two consecutive re-elections if they had already been president, and he had already been president two times. Ortega was re-elected with a judicial ruling that violated the Constitution. In 2004, 14, he reformed the Constitution to allow himself to have an indefinite 
indefinite re-election. 2009 to 2016, with massive financial support from Venezuela, Ortega and family acquired most media networks and expanded their economic dominance. One important thing for you to understand with regards to this particular thing is the fact that he controlled the information that the people in Nicaragua had. And that is the reason why those few independent media that exist today in Nicaragua, that's why Daniel Ortega is out to destroy and to put them in jail, uh, to make them flee the country, and if necessary, to kill them, because, by the way, already one journalist was killed while he was reporting what was happening in Nicaragua. Presidential elections in 2016. He is re-elected for a second consecutive time. He pushed through a court ruling that will allow him, as I said, indefinite re-election. He named his wife, Rosario Murillo, the vice president, <coughs> and presumably his hair abound. About two-thirds of the electorate stayed at home. April 2018, the unraveling and the order to shoot on sight. In light of the massacres, Ortega was deserted by many of his allies. I will say by most of his allies. The four pillars that allow Ortega to solidify his power were one, a pact with his three, with three of the wealthiest families and the business sector, giving them tax breaks that will make even the Republicans in the US blush. Ortega embraced neoliberal policies. So let me explain to all of those that still have illusions and who speak about Nicaragua being a leftist government. We don't have a leftist government in Nicaragua. There has been a long time since Nicaragua and the Nicaraguan government was a leftist government. Uh, and, and I have been saying this, it's been for me a shock when I have discovered the pact with the wealthiest family and with the private sector. When the people in Nicaragua, and the students in particular, and the poor farmers began to demonstrate in the street, when there were barricades throughout the countries and the students were in the university, there was a call, and I was there, and I made that call to the members of the private sector, which is called COSEP in Nicaragua, to call for an indefinite, indefinite strike. During the period when Somoza was in power, there was an indefinite strike that lasted, I think, I may be wrong, 19 days. But today in Nicaragua, there has not been any strike that have lasted more than one day. And that, once again, I make an appeal to the private sector in Nicaragua to support the people of Nicaragua and call for an indefinite strike. And not to make any more pacts with Daniel Ortega. Second, a sector of the Catholic Church, Ortega posed as a born against Christian in one of his elections. He received the support of the late Cardinal Obando y Bravo. And as a payback for his support, Ortega introduced the anti-abortion laws, even in cases of rape. But let me explain something. The Catholic Church today in Nicaragua is completely different. The bishops um, that have promoted a, a negotiation in national dialogue, have been risking that life to support the people of Nicaragua and to denounce what Daniel Ortega is doing. That is why Daniel Ortega is accusing them of being golpistas, which mean people who are trying to overthrow the government. No, they are not trying to overthrow the government. All they're trying to do was really to, uh, to, uh, to bring the people of Nicaragua from all political sides to a negotiating table. Three, 
Venezuela gave tremendous financial support to Ortega with the country's oil, but the oil and money had now run out. Ortega claimed to enforce U.S. interests in the region. For a while, the Ortega government appeared to be supporting the U.S. interests by controlling drug traffic and migration to, U to the U.S. with its security police and military. He also allowed sweatshop, neoliberal trade, and financial investment. As you can see, today Daniel Ortega is left with his repressive state apparatus. The police, the riot police, the paramilitary forces, a mighty arsenal of weapons, much of this came from Russia, an increasing complicity of the army. So I, as a Nicaragua, will not rest, will continue to do what I've been doing, which is to lobby governments throughout the world, to lobby the European Union, to lobby the Latin American countries so that the OAS can impose the democratic charter on Daniel Ortega, his wife, and the government, and for governments to realize that the longer they let Daniel Ortega, the more people will be killed, the more people will be tortured, the more people will be put in jail that are innocent, the more people will flee the country, and that we must, we must do everything in our power to stop the killings and the murders. And I appeal to all of you to support it. Please follow me on Twitter at Bianca Jagger, on Facebook at the Bianca Jagger Human Rights Foundation, and on Instagram at Bianca Jagger. I thank you for being here and for your support. Thank you very much. And just one last thing before I leave. In Nicaragua today, it's a crime to wear the flag. It is a crime to have the flag. It is a crime to walk and call for freedom in Nicaragua. Therefore, I'd like to join all of those who are criminals and to wear the Nicaraguan flag. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. In words of Spanish uh, political scholar Salvador Martí, with the return of President Daniel Ortega in 2007, Nicaragua turned, and I quote, into a hybrid regime. This type of regimes are also known as illiberal regimes or empty democracies. However, since uh, 18 April 2018, as uh, Bianca Jagger clearly explained, very few people in Nicaragua and around the world doubt that Nicaragua has turned into a fully-fledged dictatorship. There is no other way to define a political regime which, in addition to its track record of human rights violations, has demolished all democratic institutions, including the judicial system, the electoral system, and even national police. In April 18, uh, 2018, Nicaragua experienced anti-government protests that had resulted in close to 600 people killed, thousands more injured, 580 political prisoners, and close to 70,000 Nicaraguan refugees dispersed in several countries such as Costa Rica, Honduras, Guatemala, the United States of America, Spain, and Panama, among many other countries. In April, Demonstrators took the streets calling for democracy, respect for human rights, and the resignation of Daniel Ortega. The governmental response was shocking. A shoot-to-kill policy, which even included police snipers shooting against unarmed population, as I was able to witness myself 
on Mother's Day on May 30th. Why Nicaraguans went out to the streets in April and continued to build a resistance movement against Daniel Ortega and his family? Why so many former Sandinistas have joined the resistance? It was clear that the overwhelming majority of Nicaraguans had had enough of a regime that was able to consolidate due to a number of factors that I will try to illustrate. One of the most important factors is precisely Nicaragua's short-lived democratic experiment and therefore the absence of robust institutions capable of limiting the power of so-called caudillos. There are, as well, complex aspects of political culture that favor the emergence of authoritarian leadership, the caudillos I just mentioned. In the absence of the rule of law, authoritarianism undoubtedly deforms into tyranny. That is what happened to Daniel Ortega, originally seen as a caudillo that is a charismatic, nationalistic, and authoritarian leader who abandoned his Marxist origins and unexpectedly turned to conservative policies, Ortega is now perceived, even by former allies as Bianca, as a dictator who was an ally of the Sandinista revolution in the 1980s, a very brave voice against the invasion. The dynamics of hybrid regimes, why some countries remain stable over time while others become either more democratic or more autocratic are not easy to understand. Nicaragua has called the attention of a number of scholars interested in democracy building, precisely because many of the prevailing institutions and informal rules that shape the political context are only explained through a deep understanding of our history. The country's violent political history has placed it among the poorest countries in Latin America. Yet, obstacles towards inclusive economic growth and democratic reforms persist not only in the more visible norms dictated by national laws, public policies, and bureaucracies, but in the most intricate beliefs, legacies, and expectations of the actors of the political system. This set of beliefs is essentially the political culture. European traveler, for example, in the 19th century, Geoffrey Roach coined Nicaragua an un ungovernable country with elites, and I quote, incapable of reaching basic political consensus. Likewise, when describing the fragility of national identity, many Nicaraguan intellectuals use harder words to describe this social phenomenon. For example, uh, Nicaraguan scholar Andres Perez Baltodano called Nicaragua an implausible country. He said, and I quote, we failed despite having experimented with socialist models, military dictatorships, and different shades of neoliberalism implemented by conservative and liberal governments, all of it to no effect. Almost 200 years of independence, our Caribbean coast is still as isolated as when we set off our national adventure, end of quote. Nicaragua citizenry entered the 21st century with unresolved issues of a fragmented society in the face of a fragile state. This social fragility is well documented by uh, academic research. For example, in words of Justin Wolf from the University of Nebraska, this lack of political consensus in Nicaragua, and I quote, provides key to understanding the rise of 20th century figures such as revolutionary Augusto Sandino and dictator Anastasio Somoza, end of quote. I will argue that Daniel Ortega is exactly the result of such deeply rooted authoritarian tradition, the caudillo tradition. On the other hand, from the perspective of the uninformed outsider, Daniel Ortega has an electoral mandate that started with the return of elected office in January 2007 and was supposedly reconfirmed through re-election processes in 2011 and 2016. However, one of the most fundamental aspects related to the political and human rights crisis in Nicaragua is the lack of free and fair elections since Ortega returned to power. In that sense, it's important to remember that prior to 2007, consecutive re-election was not allowed in the Nicaraguan Constitution. Yet Ortega ran for president in 2011 against the Constitution. On November 6, 2016, Nicaragua held general elections with again Ortega as candidate. In that regard, the massive protest that spontaneously erupted in April 2018 
we are deeply rooted in the lack of free and fair elections in Nicaragua. Since at least, since at least 2008, the credibility of the entire electoral system was strongly questioned by many sectors of the population and by several international organizations, including the European Union, due to irregularities which occurred during the electoral processes. For example, on January 2012, a group of eminent international electoral experts under the Carter Center issued the Study Mission Report, which is widely available on the internet. In its findings, the Carter Report highlighted, and I quote, fraudulent elections. The study by the Carter Center said that, and I quote, the 2011 elections in Nicaragua were not transparent and none of the opposition parties accepted the results, end of quote. Yet, the November 2016 elections were organized by the same officials who contributed to the electoral frauds of 2008, 2011, 2012. Despite ample requests for greater electoral transparency, Daniel Ortega did not allow any democratic reform and even forced the National Coalition for Democracy, uh, at that time the broader opposition alliance, to withdraw from the 2016 elections. He achieved exactly what he wanted. By illegally dissolving the Coalition for Democracy, he was able to eradicate all opposition parties. On January 10, 2017, Daniel Ortega was sworn for another term as Nicaraguan president and his wife, Rosario Murillo, became the new vice president. Ortega and Vice President Murillo were elected with 72.5 of the vote, but with a high abstention rate of 78.5%. Uh, the Sandinista National Liberation Front won 71 of the 92 seats in parliament. The PLC, which was one of the few parties that accepted the rules of the game imposed by Ortega, moved from having only two seats in parliament to having over 25 seats in parliament. The Coalition for Democracy, of course, was not allowed to run. In addition to the backslidings in the electoral system, since Ortega returned to power in 2007, the country suffered human rights violations, with, which not only include restrictions on citizens' right to vote, but also obstacles to freedom of speech and press, including government intimidation and harassment of journalists and independent media. According to the CPDH, the Centro por Derechos Humanos, and the CENID, the Centro Nicaragüense de Derechos Humanos, prior to 2018, at least 60 people were subject to extrajudicial killings. This was prior to 2018. The Ortega regime also signified a severe challenge to independent media. More than 90% of all media outlets in the country are, are in some way controlled by government, many of them by Ortega's family directly. In 2016, the Inter-American Press Association reported on censorship of independent media in Nicaragua, concluding, and I quote, the authoritarianism of, the, of Daniel Ortega has aggravated censorship, which creates greater risk for freedom of the press and democracy, end of quote. It is in this context of weak institutions that the new version of the Sandinista party emerged. It has nothing or little to do with the idealistic Sandinista party of the 1980s. The current Sandinista party, widely defined as Orteguista, is an elaborate political intricacy, highly centralized of, around the Ortega family. The Sandinista party has incorporated in the ruling an intelligent mechanism of, of councils and cabinets for citizens' power that report directly to Rosario Murillo and are distributed all around the country. These structures, also known as family cabinets, gabinetes de la familia, are guided by a highly religious and mystical narrative as developed by Ms. Murillo. Since Ortega returned to power, the socialist ideology that guided the Sandinista party in the 1980s has vanished, and to the shock and surprise of many people, it was substituted by an ideology based, and I quote, of family values, Christianity, nationalism, and solidarity, end of quote. Under Vice President Murillo as ideologue, the Sandinista party is now a radical party which promotes nationalism at all costs. Any political idea that opposes the Sandinista party, even in the most subtle way, is automatically accused to represent foreign interests. 
Sandinista party arouses popular enthusiasm by sophisticated propaganda techniques for anti-liberal, violent exclusionary agenda. The Sandinista party of 2007 is effectively a new ideology, widely defined as orteguismo, orteguism. Whether that is a branch of Sandinismo or not, that is open for debate, and it's clear that it's one of the most controversial topics among progressives in Nicaragua. The truth of the matter is that the Sandinista party is not only a movement plagued with political narrative that has nothing to do with the lefty movements of the 1980s. Let me give you some simple examples of orteguism, orteguismo. Orteguism is currently one of the most fervent critics of the feminist and women movement in Nicaragua. The Ortega regime not only established some of the most strict laws in Latin America against women's reproductive rights, as clearly explained by Ms. Bianca Jagger in her presentation, but has publicly defined the women's movement in Nicaragua as a sort of public enemy number one. Also, the Sandinista party, a party that once welcomed international solidarity and became attracted to thousands of progressive friends around the world, has become the strongest anti-immigration force in Central America. Its anti-immigration stance allowed Ortega to become a close ally of the United States for many years prior to April 2018. Under Ortega, Nicaragua became a sort of wall to immigration from South America to, to North America. Many of you have followed the news, for example, of the close to 30,000 undocumented refugees moving from South America to the north that were not allowed to pass through Nicaraguan territory, particularly Cuban migrants. Even more so, Ortega has recently striped of their Nicaraguan nationality. Several people who immigrated to Nicaragua in the 1980s became naturalized citizens, and just because writing a tweet or issuing a political idea have been striped from their Nicaraguan nationality. The cases of Ana Quiroz and Alberto Boschi are only two of the most visible examples. Another major factor of Ortega returns to power was his strong relationship with the main representatives of the most powerful economic groups in Nicaragua. As president-elect on December 15, 2016, one of his first acts was to hold a meeting with members of COSEP to define as what he called his development, development axis. On that occasion, Ortega affirmed, and I quote his own words, this is an unprecedented meeting the beginning of our great alliance, end of quote. The outcome was mind-blowing. A central part of the pact with the private sector was to give COSEP the role of a consultative body for the government in the drafting of laws and regulations, the dream of any big business to write their own laws. In practice, Ortega had substituted Nicaraguan parliament by granting big business the capacity to draft the laws. From 2008 to 2016, COSEP drafted 70 economic laws and regulations that were passed by government. These laws gave unprecedented tax breaks to big businesses in Nicaragua. Even more so, the two largest rainforest biological reserves of Mesoamerica, which are located in Nicaragua, were open for mining concessions and other types of exploitations. Under 11 years of Ortega, Nicaragua has given more mining concessions that in a hundred years together. Under the Ortega administration, the land rights of indigenous and campesino communities have been challenged after the announcement of the Interoceanic Canal Project. As a result, campesinos and indigenous communities organized an anti-canal movement that has evolved into one of Latin America's largest and most vibrant grassroots movements. As we speak, many of the leaders of the campesino movement are in prison for fighting for their land rights that is the case of Campesino, Medardo Mairena, and Pedro Mena. Having an extractive economy largely means having a resource-based economy, depending on harvesting or extracting natural resources for trade. Such extractivism is of enormous significance in shaping the authoritarian model under Ortega. In addition to weak institutions, the fact that Nicaragua has a weak middle class is another fundamental condition that has uh, allowed the consolidation of a dictatorship in Nicaragua. One of the most powerful images to implant the importance of the middle class is that of society's spinal cord, in words of Ortega y Gasset. We're lacking that spinal cord. The middle class in Nicaragua was about 12% based on the 
calculations of the central bank in 2007 is as, as of 2016 less than 9% and is declining at about 1% per year. However, 90% of Nicaraguans live with the equivalent of, a, of less than 10 pounds a day. 90% of Nicaraguans. Households that have exceeded the poverty line are extremely vulnerable. And official data reveals that seven out of 10 jobs are precarious and informal. Yet, according to the WealthX report, which monitors private banking in Central America, Nicaragua is the country in Central America with the largest number of ultra-rich people. That is, families with an independent wealth of more than $100 million. Only Panama has more than us. A decisive factor of this economic inequality and reduced middle class is the unjust fiscal system imposed by Ortega regime. Under his new tax code, Ortega has, especially those generated from capital income. So under the new tax code, the law 891, I can give you a perfect example of how public policies are not designed to strengthen the middle class. Law 891 tends to increase levels of income inequality by taxing basic needs such as closing, you can check that on the, on the law. Closing national footwear and completely freeing zero tax to helicopters and jets. Thanks, Mr. Ortega. Yet elites within all the political spectrum in Nicaragua have a bias toward the middle class and also towards the rural class. That explains the reason why the Campesino movement is currently the most vibrant and vocal opposition against Ortega and his wife, Rosario Murillo. The urban bias of Nicaragua's elites continues to be evident in many ways. Electoral representation and government expenditure is disproportionately biased towards cities of Managua, Granada, and Leon. Also, the conflict and resistance of Law 840 gives a 100-year concession to Chinese businessman Wang Jin to develop and build an interoceanic canal in Nicaragua. And this can only be fully understood under the light of the urban bias that persists today. Despite all our challenges, in April 18, a new Nicaragua was born. Thanks to the leadership of an inspiring grassroots movement led by students, women, and campesinos of Northern Nicaragua, for the first time in decades, we have a chance for a more inclusive Nicaragua. I strongly believe that the consensus is the only direct way available in today's world to consolidate democracy. We have learned from the Nicaraguan experience that when political consensus is weak, there are strong incentives for the making of dictators. The students that gave their life, such as Alvarito Conrado, the student and grassroots leaders from diverse social movements who endure prison and torture, such as Levi Rugama, Yaritza Mairena, Victoria Obando, and many, many others, are Nicaragua's greatest hope for a new society where no dictator, no matter his or her political ideology, will impose his will on free men and women. Democracy will no, will no longer be a dream. Thank you. Up in twos and threes. No. Do stop. Um, okay. Yeah, um, is this working? No. Uh, I'm going to turn it on. It's on here. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Yes. This one works. You got it. Um, yes. I, I wanted to ask a question about uh, about future. Really. Um, I mean, I, I would say I, I should. Um, State that I'm from the Nicaragua Solidarity Campaign, we have a lot of different view of what the of what facts of the issues are. Um, uh, but I don't particularly want to talk about that. Um, obviously, lots of distressing events have happened this year. The question is where we go from here. Now, if you think that the best thing for Nicaragua, for the majority of the Nicaraguan people, are neoliberal policies, then uh, it's probably fairly clear which direction it might go. But uh, presuming that that's not the case for, for, for most people, um, what, is, what is the future? Is there a possibility, in, in your view, for a reform of the FSLN, uh, maybe with Ortega and Maria stepping down and being replaced by a younger generation? 
uh, some sort of reforms which are beginning to happen, at least in Cuba now, um, or is, do you, do, would you regard that as being impossible? And if the FSLN um, cannot be regarded as being a possible future um, and, be, being, and representing left position, as I say, something I would dispute, but if you think that that is the case, then what are the options as the only main opposition parties uh, seem to represent a fairly extreme right position? Should I start, or you want to start first? Yeah, you can start. Okay. Uh, first of all, a message to uh, uh, the Nicaraguan Solidarity Campaign. I, I am a son of a political prisoner under the Ortega, under the, the, the Somoza dictatorship, and uh, uh, my father was a, a person who devoted his uh, short life to the Sandinista Revolution. I grew up around friends from around the world who slept at our house, people from UK, people from Bulgaria from all around the world. So I know that those people in these solidarity campaigns are good people. You, uh, most of you really trust and that they're, that think they're doing the right thing because there is a, a sort of romanticism to the Sandinista revolution of the, of the 1980s. And I will not go into whether the Sandinista revolution uh, lost its track in 1980 or in 1990. What I'm saying is that we're, what we're suffering in Nicaragua is not an ideological issue. And it's important to tackle, that's my first message, we need to tackle the Nicaraguan crisis from the human rights perspective. It's the only way to really tackle this issue. There are a lot of open wounds from both sides. There are a lot of people who have suffered in Nicaragua. So the first point in terms of future is that we need to tackle repression from the perspective of human rights. Um, repression is something that in Nicaragua it's, it's, uh, it's closing the opportunity and the window of opportunity for a peaceful resolution to the crisis. In Nicaragua you have thousands of Nicaraguans that do not have a track record of peaceful resolution. We, we, uh, we do not have uh, really the expertise to, to tackle uh, these kind of issues as we should. We are a country with a uh, uh, deep open wounds of, of conflict and therefore we are afraid that when we have and we see torture and repression, uh, those of us who speak of nonviolence are perceived as morons by those who are suffering. So for, from my perspective it's really heartbreaking to see that Daniel Ortega is really tackling the moderates. So once again about future, I think that we need to, um, as we said in Spanish, have cabeza fría, we need to be calm and really try to develop an even playing field under uh, uh, a uh, complete respect of human rights in Nicaragua. Would Sandinistas play a role in the democratic transition? Of course. This is not about eradicating uh, Sandinistas. This is not about taking ven vengeance. This is about stopping the repression and developing free and fair uh, um, e electoral rules so everyone can have the opportunity to compete under different circumstances. But the political question is subject in terms of hierarchy to the human rights uh, uh, questions. By, by tackling the human rights question, I must say and publicly admit, as I said in every single presentation, that violence has been completely disproportionate. But there is, of course, violence in the other side of those who, who also protested against President Ortega. And the mothers of the 22 police officers that were killed, they also deserve justice. So it's impossible to, to think about justice and transition without truth. But our key argument is that the Ortega regime doesn't have the legitimacy, nor the strength, nor the neutrality to tackle the human rights question. And that's why we're here. We're trying to involve the international community in addressing the Nicaraguan issue, not as a partisan or ideological issue, but as a human rights question. Once we solve the human rights question, I am sure that all Nicaraguans will be capable of solving our own problems by finally creating a roadmap to towards democracy. Yeah. We will not be able to achieve peace in Nicaragua if we begin to say that the people who supported the Sandinista uh, revolution cannot be part of the solution for Nicaragua. We must uh, have an open uh, dialogue, in, we must be inclusive, 
we must remember as well and be aware that many Sandinistas are fighting against Daniel Ortega, that many Sandinistas and former uh, fighters in the revolution are in jail, and that therefore we cannot have policies that exclude anyone in the solution for Nicaragua. And just as Felix has said, I think that the paramount issue at the moment in Nicaragua is the following. The people of Nicaragua are determined to have a nonviolent resistance. It is quite extraordinary to see the commitment of the people not to engage in an armed struggle. It probably, it's simple. It's a simple reaction to the fact that 50,000 people died during the revolution, that fought because they believe that this revolution was going to achieve democracy, freedom, and justice. And then that you see one of the leaders of this revolution who is a murderous dictator. Therefore, the Nicaraguans don't want any more a bloodshed of that kind. So that makes the situation very, very difficult. Because what do we have to overthrow this murderous, brutal dictator? The only thing that we have is the people that can express and can demonstrate, the people that can use social media. The international community role is critical. We can, on our own, defeat Daniel Ortega. We need the international community to support us. We need the international community to impose sanctions. We need the international community to uh, impose the, the, the OAS, to impose the democratic charter. We need them all. We are a very vulnerable people that are being murdered by a government that is very, that has very sophisticated weapons versus the rest of the country that is against him that has no weapons whatsoever. I'd like to make, uh, well, a comment and a question. Um, uh, the comment is that I'm um, a little bit distressed to see the enthusiasm with which you face um, international sanctions against Nicaragua. Um, historically, I don't think sanctions have done anything against the regimes they're supposedly exactly. aimed at. Um, we only have to look at um, pre-invasion Iraq, where I can't remember now whether it was 500,000 or a million people died during, during the sanctions imposed on, uh, uh, on, on, on Iraq. Um, and um, frankly, um, if you imagine that uh, the intentions of the United States administration, any United States administration imposing sanctions on a country in South America, Central or South America, were for uh, in the interests of the ordinary people of uh, of those countries. I think, frankly, that would be the first time since the uh, promulgation of the Monroe Doctrine in the in the eighteen twenties that the United States had done that. I think when when sanctions are imposed by the United States, can I answer your question? Uh, well, can I can I finish the comment? It is is purely in 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 the interests of of corporate America. Um, but that's my comment, which, yes, p please come back on. But I, I do also have a question, and, th and that is, um, d to an extent, um, connected with, with my previous comment, and, and that is uh, about the involvement of, um, whether it's CIA or other in, uh, elements of, of the secret service uh, of, of the United States in, um, in the events uh, since April. Um, and um, I suppose wh while I can understand why uh, Nicaraguans involved in these events would deny any involvement of the United States, my question would be, why wouldn't they be involved? 
why wouldn't they be involved in getting rid or trying, trying to get rid of a regime that they have spent decades uh, trying to get rid of? Yeah, let me answer that question. First of all, the nonviolent insurrection in Nicaragua is not a leftist movement or a rightist movement. That is not an ideology against him. You have people from all walks of life. You have people the, from the poor farmers to the students, to the church, to the media, to um, some of the private sector who had been vocal and who have participated in this nonviolent insurrection. I have been in Nicaragua in May and April, and I was able to march with the people on the 30th of May, where there was a, it was Mother's Day in Nicaragua, where you had an overwhelming march of people. I was stunned to be participant. And I will tell you something. Early on that day, I had gone to visit the students at the Yunnan University, where there were atrincherados, and, and where I met him. And one of them, Levis, that I mentioned before, came with me and accompanied me. While we were marching, that day, 18 people were killed. Shoot to kill, okay? with the sniper shooters that were shooting at us. He helped me get out of there. And there were between 70 and 80 people wounded. No, let me tell you, it may look like America was funded. It is not been funded by the US. I think that my credentials uh, speak for themselves. I have opposed the United States intervention, not just in Nicaragua, in Iraq, I have been to Iraq, I have been to Afghanistan, I have been throughout the world, I have fought against and denounced the, 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 uh, the, the role that the US played in El Salvador. There is a difference between the sanctions imposed to Iraq, which I was a voice against it, against something new that exists that is called the Magnitsky Global Act, which puts sanctions on individual people, not only on their finances, but as well on their travel rights and on many other things. At first, when I heard of the NICA Act, I was very troubled and very disturbed and was not, I didn't come out to support it right away. Now, when Senator Menendez worked with Senator Patrick Leahy. Senator Patrick Leahy is a Democrat. It is a man that I have known for many years, a man who is very concerned about human rights issues and who took this bill that was imposed on the sanctions on Nicaragua to try to make it so that it will not have such a humanitarian impact on the people of Nicaragua. I urge all of you to read and learn about what the Magnitsky Global Act is, which is now being called, for this particular case, the Magnitsky Nicaraguan Act. It was created by a, uh, to uh, sanction corrupt individuals who have been involved as well in human rights violations in Russia. The United States at first was not interested in Nicaragua. Donald Trump is not interested really in Nicaragua. We, I have gone to lobby members of the State Department who know well that I have been a voice against the Contra War. I have gone to lobby the ambassador, Nikki Haley, to discuss with her because she brought the issue of the human right of Nicaragua to the uh, General Assembly at the United Nations. All I can tell you is, no, this is not a movement that was financed by the US. 
this is the the answer of Daniel Ortega to try to excuse the murder of innocent people by claiming that is the that is an intervention of the US. The real intervention in Nicaragua, the Russians sold Nicaragua 50 tanks. We haven't yet seen them. The weapons that have been used to shoot to kill, the weapons of war that have been used against kids. There's been 23 children killed in Nicaragua. There have been 70 students killed in Nicaragua. There are 50 students in jail and who have already are under the, the, the legal process. And there are 7, 150 that have not been charged yet. These are kids with who I am in touch. These kids don't have anything. These 50,000 people or more that are in Costa Rica who are the people who are asking for asylum, they're living under terrible conditions. Where is the mighty United States helping them? All I can tell you is that my track record of nearly 40 years as a human rights campaigner denouncing interventions and denouncing US intervention on all those countries that you're concerned with. I can assure you, I wouldn't be asking for sanctions if I thought in any possible way that that's what was going to happen. If, if I may quickly add, you, you, you asked why not? Why could, um, it's important to understand uh, how complicated Central America is in terms of, 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 of organized crime, drugs. Out of the 10 most um, uh, dangerous cities in the world, three of them are in Central America. Prior to that, Nicaragua was an exception. Nicaragua was one of the safest countries in, in, in Latin America. And as hard as it is to understand, the US government was actually very happy with the Nicaraguan police and the Nicaraguan army in its capacity to deal with uh, undocumented migrants moving from the south to the north, its capacity to deal with drug trafficking, and also in its capacity to keep Nicaragua a relatively safe country. So Bianca has pointed out something very important. The, the Nicaraguan Conditionality Act was, Act was actually defeated in the US Congress before. See, precisely because the United States was not really willing to, to get, get involved. Uh, um, uh, the, what, what really happened in April is that the uh, uh, Sandinista government and the police did not know how to handle the, the protests, frankly speaking. I think, and this is only a very personal opinion, that if the, uh, 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 politically speaking, if the government had just allowed the students just to protest for a few days without <coughs> having such a massive uh, a violent response, probably the situation will be completely different. Now they're trying to blame the United States for a mess that they, they created. And I think that we're falling once again into the oversimplification of the world. I've seen a lot of, of uh, um, uh, uh, issues that people quickly blame socialism, you know, uh, as a card that they, you know, quickly use when they want to discredit someone. And then in the other, side of the political spectrum, people blame the United States. I think that at this time it's important to understand that this is, this is not something created by the United States. It's something that was created by the, uh, by, by the lack of capacity to deal with the protests in a peaceful way. Um, rush of questions. So there's one from Baroness Kennedy over there and then uh, over there next uh -huh. and third down here. This side. Um, before Two. this gentleman over there. Yeah, so no can more. I suggest that we take those four questions all at once? Thank mm. you. Um, can, can, I, can, I, can I start? Um, 
I, I want to thank both of you for very, very interesting presentations. And I, I know that there will be some people from Central America here tonight or from Latin America, and they will, they will be much more knowledgeable than those of us who are not from that part of the world, because I'm sure you keep yourself much more informed than many of us do. And as we know, um, the press here in Britain are not big on dealing with uh, um, uh, South America, and, uh, and, and certainly not very big on dealing with Central America. And so I found it very, very interesting, and I want to pay tribute to my friend Bianca Jagger, because Bianca's jo job of work over many, many years has been to challenge governments of whatever complexion when they're abusing human rights. And that's one of the things about human rights activists, is that they have to be doing it. Um, whatever your particular um, um, worldview, um, if you see people, if you're a person of the left and you see left governments or governments that claim to be of the left, um, you can be quite sentimental about how they came into being. Um, but I'm telling you, once they start shooting and killing people and people start disappearing, and once they, you have extrajudicial ch uh, uh, killings and journalists can't write free articles criticizing them, once all of that is going on, then we have to look to our own laurels and say, you know, is this, is this still what we had in mind when we supported, um, the, you know, the Nicaraguan solidarity campaigns and so on, as I did too in my youth. And so what I, I really want to say is we've seen this kind of thing happening in other places. We saw it happening in Zimbabwe. A great, a great liberation movement leader uh, um, uh, in Mugabe um, becoming more and more repressive um, as time went on. And so we, we shouldn't be surprised. And what we have to keep analyzing is why does this happen? How does this happen? And what, it, what is it that stops the kind of transition of countries that um, go through a, a revolution, um, seek democracy, seek change, and do so because of the huge disparities between rich and poor, wanting to create more even societies, and the difficulties that are in making transition to turn into the kind of place that is then multi-party. Because you know you can't just c carry on expecting to, to, to exist as a sort of one-party state. And for a long time, people are very romantic about it. We've seen it in South Africa, about the ANC, are romantic about the party of liberation and the people who led that great uh, movement. And then we become much too per per permissive and, and, if you like, forgiving um, of bad things that they do because we remember well the, the, the transition. Of course, there are going to be people in Nicaragua, I suspect, the super rich, who will be very hugga with people in the United States who are neoliberals, and we can just imagine the, the folk who will be basically wanting to support them in developing parties that will not have the interests of the great majority of Nicaraguans at their heart, and um, who will not care about the poor, but who will care about the investment possibilities and so on that there might be in, in having connections with right-wing parties in Nicaragua. Um, I would imagine that the people who are on the street are of many different complexions. People in rural communities often are, are, are in many ways often in terms of their social ma um, attitudes, very conservative, but who want to have a fairer, fairer crack of the whip and want to be able to live a decent life. And so everybody will come with different pieces and different bits of their uh, of, of political perspective. But it has to be that we say, all of us who care about human rights, that is unacceptable what's happening. And as far as I'm concerned, that, that is the bottom line. You know, if you care about humanity, then you have to say, it doesn't matter who's doing it and what the political complexion, it is not acceptable. And movements that are supportive and have been supportive in the past have to review their commitment and solidarity. And we saw the shame, shameful businesses that used to happen about forgiving things that happened in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe and all of that, forgiving it for far too long after bad things were happening and we have to speak out about it. I just want to do to so I just want to talk about I want to talk about the business of sanctions. I I share some of the concerns about sanctions. You know, I, 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 I think that sanctions can be crude and coarse and they're burden they are burden on the ordinary people of nations. One of the things that has been sh sharpening up, although I'm not that confident that Nikki Haley is going to be the person that's going to be the great protector of this, um, but one of the things that I, I um, believe very strongly is that um, uh, visa restrictions are very important, stopping people getting the money out of countries so that actually um, people who have been leaders in countries and their friends who are the rich in those countries and the, and the kind of amassing of wealth at the expense of the poor is, the, is, the, 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 is the basically the 
the property of the of the folk of the country, and they get the money out in case of change, and they 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 therefore try to kind of invest in other places, have properties in other places, and they send their children to school in other places and universities, and they, uh, they, they you know, basically solidify their resources outside of the nation. And, and that is one of the things that you, we, has to be stopped. And you do it by going after those who have money and, who are, and stopping them having visas, stopping them laundering their ill-gotten gains by getting them out of the country and investing them in properties and so on and looking at you know having the money trail it's very very difficult to do because you have to have good people on your side to identify um, uh, where how that money is making its way out so i am absolutely in favor of the use of Mag the magnitsky um, legislation when we say it's a global law though i mean it's basically the attempt is to make it global it's still not global but what we're one's doing is going after individuals who have been abusers of human rights. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, Ortega is quite clearly an abuser of human rights, but one would want to look at the people around him and also the people who are not in government, but who are making money, who are around him and supporting him. And, uh, and I definitely think that um, if you con concern yourself with human rights, one of the things you have to use is selective and targeted uh, uh, sanctions, but against individuals and ones that don't uh, um, affect you know, massively the whole business of food you know, and stuff going into countries and um, really making the, the people in countries suffer. So it's, very, it's a difficult thing to do. A question I wanted to ask of Felix was you said, and, and it was said twice when you spoke, you spoke about the business of failing um, um, to, to create consensus and that this is, was a historic thing in Nicaragua. And I wasn't sure that I understood what you meant about that. And most of our polities are, are, don't gain complete consensus. We may have consensus about the importance of democracy and the form that democracy takes, and that's more than voting, and that you have to have a free press, you have to have the rule of law, that judges have to be independent and can't be sacked, and people, you know, you respect the constitution. Could but what I'm asking you is, sorry, what does could you just get to the end? Of yeah. The well, question. the point is, wh what do you mean when you say there's no consensus? Nations don't have consensus, and it's in that challenging of each other that you try to reach for democracy. Thank you very much. As I said, we will pick up a few questions first uh, before coming back to the panel. Hi. Um, I think it would be interesting to know why roundtable discussions um, aren't possible because there's a big view that it would be good for Sandinistas and everybody to have that discussion. So what are the barriers to those open discussions? Hello. Um, a, a, a broader question. Um, there was a lot of hope for many governments 15 years ago in Latin America. Um, and since then, obviously, uh, a lot of people have lost faith uh, in many of those uh, governments of the left. Um, um, and you could see protests in Brazil and elsewhere where people wore the flag. I'm not saying they're like you, Bianca, at all. Um, and, and, and then the, the result in Brazil, at least, is the complete opposite, where we have an extreme right winger. Um, I, I'm not saying at all you, 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 you are likely to become this, but my question is, especially given what you've said, Felix, about the link between sort of extractivist economies and authoritarian cordillos, um, is this somehow inevitable that even if you're on the left you become authoritarian or on you're on the right and you become authoritarian because extractivist economies depend on a small number of people controlling the assets uh, and the question is about distribution so but my question is not whether it's just whether it's inevitable but to you um, to both of you in latin america at the moment when you look at all of these countries and how they're going is there one leader or one country that gives you hope for a, a, a system in which there is development, but there's distribution and social justice? Thank you. And environmental protection. Hello, Bianca and Felix. Um, I am from Nicaragua. I am a postgrad student at the LSE, 
and I just arrived here two months ago. And before that, I was also in Nicaragua. And I was at the marches and I saw everything that happened. And I know that like you, it was not a thing of left or right. It was something of everyone in the country and uh, um, feeling of sense that when you were walking in the streets, you could be next to anyone. And it was a palpable feeling of pain. And it feels like um, after we had the dialogue, that sense has been dying out. Not because it's not there, but because of the fear that the government has created. So I would want to know, what is your view on how do we prevent Nicaragua from turning into Venezuela and from being for years with this man in power? And how do you view the transition so that when he is out, there is not a vacuum of power and that we have the institutions for the enfranchisement process to really represent all Nicaraguans and to have democracy and have a good one as well. I like, I like your answer. Suppose that you were to speak and take up more questions. No. no. Yeah. Um, muchas gracias por estar aquí. Primero. The most, the one thing that is clear to me is that the solution for Nicaragua is not an easy one. As I said before, and as you said, is that you have, in the one hand, a dictatorship that is ruthless, brutal, and is prepared to kill anyone who will oppose him, who is prepared to put in jail innocent people, students, or anyone, just simply, and accuse them, and they introduce legislations so that they can charge them for being a terrorist. But the bottom line is that the government of Daniel Ortega and Rosario Maria is a terrorist state. We have no weapons. We're seeing that the people are totally at, the, at his mercy to either be killed, tortured, put in jail, or forced to flee the country. We don't have yet a consensus among the people. And one of the things that we discussed last night with Felix is how do we get this consensus among all the political factions in Nicaragua. The one thing I think that is important when we talk about the influence of the United States, and in response maybe to your question of extractivist um, governments, is that what I have come, I recently was at a debate at the LSE, and it was about dictatorships. It used to be very simple to say dictatorships from the right, and then we were defending dictators, we were defending governments from the left. But if we look at Latin America today, you see someone like me who had hoped for progressive governments in Cuba, in Venezuela, in Nicaragua. These governments have become dictatorships. These governments uh, are killing the citizens like they are in Venezuela. But so you have as well this terrible government that you have today in Brazil. I have spent my life defending human rights. I have spent my life defending indigenous people against the exploitation of na and, and communities, against the exploitation of the natural resources. But when we look and when you tell me, give me a government that will give you hope, it's very difficult. It's very difficult because beside human right, I spend my life speaking about, hum about environmental defenders that are being assassinated throughout the world because they are defending their land, because they are defending um, their natural resources. So I don't know what I can say to you. All I can hope is that, that there will be a way and that I believe that this 
sanctions imposed on individuals, on corrupt individuals, and on individuals who are committing crimes against humanity, that they will be able to uh, send a message that they will not stop, that they will have their, their, their properties outside and their wealth and their right to be able to travel to be curtailed. Those individual sanctions on them, that they will have an effect. But we don't want only the United States to impose them. We want the European Union, we want the uh, Latin American countries to all work together so that the answer that this gentleman made, which is uh, uh, valid, that we do not have only the United States applying them such. Um, very quick remarks. When I spoke about consensus, I added the concept of fragmented society. Of course, absolute consensus in its pure sense is not impossible, but, uh, but, but um, I mean, you can look at um, developed uh, democracies, and I agree with me that basic agreement on what are the rules of the game. Basically, we don't, we don't need to agree on the full spectrum of policies, but at least in the fundamental rules of the game. So what I try to convey is that Nicaragua has not reached that basic agreement. So when you try to understand what happened in Nicaragua and say, well, but Ortega has a mandate, uh, most people are really, uh, those who make those kind of comments from outside are uninformed about the weak institutions. And the fact that Nicaragua, even in 2006 when Ortega was elected, was not a fully fledged democracy. And this is not only a problem of Ortega. Let me be absolutely clear. The, the key problem of Nicaragua is not Daniel Ortega. The, pre the key problem of Nicaragua is the fragmented society that has not been able to create those fundamental rules of the game. So we can get rid of Ortega, and tomorrow another you know, authoritarian leader can come and evolve into a dictator. So my key point is that in order to have a robust democracy, we need to think this beyond ideologies and try to promote as much as we can uh, uh, the conversation around fundamental rules of the game, which connects me to the question of the lady from Nicaragua that says, how can we avoid being Venezuela? And uh, I, I wake up every day thinking about the people who have been killed, the students who have been killed, and try to think what did Venezuela do wrong that we can learn from those mistakes. And one of the biggest mistakes in Venezuela is that they turned this into an ideological issue. And also, the voices of nonviolence are getting more and more. So of course, you, we are speaking or hearing about uh, even invasion as an option in, in Venezuela, you see? And that really scares me a lot. So when we try to keep the moderate voices, I think that dictators are really scared of moderates. You know, when they're scared, of, that's why they're accusing me of being, you know, a, a, a narcotraficante, a terrorist, or getting money from the CIA. Precise while they're not talking it through radical voices because dictators really want polarization. So my recommendation will be the same I gave to the students when they tried to kill me in Leon and I was stabbed. Obviously I was wearing a vest as you know and my life was said I said, We're gonna walk outside and we will not respond a single blow. I lost many of my teeth, my nose was broken, my hand was broken, and believe me, nonviolence is not theory. It's hard to be nonviolent when they kill one of your best friends. Angel Gaona was a member of YIP and he was assassinated with a shot on his forehead. I lost all my property, as you know. I've been persecuted. My family in Nicaragua is living and hidden in the jungles of some unknown place. And it's hard for me not to hate. But my recommendation will be do not allow your heart to be full with hatred. These things will be around. They will tell you that you're a moderate CIA agent and, and, and drug trafficker. They might even kill me. But we need to keep our moderate voice and believe that those who die at either side, those who died, because I have friends that died in the contrast, friends that died in the Sandinista revolution. Uh, my father was a political prisoner in Somoza. My parents separated for political reasons when my family lost their property. So what, sorry I'm giving my personal example, but it's not uncommon to see Nicaraguan families destroyed for this ridiculous ideological di divide that I see here, people that from 10,000 feet try to understand, try, are trying to explain what Nicaraguans are suffering with the lenses of these tax of right wing, left wing. So we, are, we cannot fall into the trap of polarization. 
We need to try to keep a moderate voice and build a Nicaragua where every Nicaraguan, Sandinistas, conservative, liberals, mestizos, people from the Caribbean coast, LGTB movement, the gay community, the Catholics, the Protestants, we can all work together on the, based on the fundamental rules of the game. That will be my key comment. And there was another, quick, well, I know that we're running out of, out of question, is authoritarianism inevitable? Yes. Yes, I, I think it's not it's it's, it's not in, inevitable, and it's connected to my previous question. I think that we really have this is the biggest hope we have in the history of Nicaragua because for the first time we're trying to move towards a a political transition without weapons. Of course, there are some people that have do not believe in that road, but we have. If we go outside of the road, of the of the nonviolent road, I think that the chances will be will be lost. What are the barriers for open discussion? I think that the biggest barrier is the question of impunity. In Nicaragua, we've always moved in political transitions, and we're probably one of the only countries in the world that gave full amnesty without investigation. So I think that that's the big elephant in the room, impunity. And we have to, uh, to really face democratic transition, uh, having in mind that we can no longer continue with severe human rights violations swept under the carpet as if they didn't happen. You know? So everyone who committed a crime in Nicaragua has to be accountable. Everyone, everyone. That's the elephant in the room and we have to break it. And I, I made this public comment, if there's a single evidence that I committed a crime, I will be the, f the, the first to face a jury in a, in a free Nicaragua when we have independent authorities. But we can no longer swept all these violations under the carpet. I, I will allow you your question. Yeah, thanks. It's ready. not a question. I bring greetings, greetings from Brussels to Bianca. I've just returned from a two-day conference on the Turkish-Kurdish question, of which you are a patron of the Kurdistan movement. So we bring greetings. We had a, a wonderful confer conference there, and I appreciate your uh, support for the, 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 the Kurdish people. Um, I should have introduced myself. My name is Father Joe Ryan. I'm a priest of the Westminster Diocese, chair of the Westminster Justice and Peace Commission, so involved in many human rights situations. I also bring greetings from Margaret Owen. Margaret Owen mentioned you, Baroness Kennedy, at least 15 times in the two days that I was with her. So she's a wonderful woman uh, working on human rights. My question is, uh, how do we get ordinary people involved in this whole question? Now, and just the, the, I should have mentioned, Bianca, when you were speaking about Nicaragua, it was a mirror image of what's happening in Turkey at the minute. Uh, the so-called democracy, and word for word, but the numbers uh, are in prison, and that should be increased tenfold because of the Turkish situation. Anyhow, um, how do we get ordinary people involved in uh, understanding what's happening in Nicaragua and in many other countries? People are sitting on the fence. Uh, the, the media don't cover the, uh, the the whole message, and so how do we get ordinary people involved to support questions? Like it's the human rights violations that we're talking about, not left or right or center. So, thank you. Well, th thank you very much, uh, and thank you for being here and for your greetings. Um, on Monday is International Human Rights Day, and as you heard very eloquently from Felix, the importance about Nicaragua is that we put an end to the human rights violations and the crimes against humanity, and that we have accountability. Under no circumstances, we should allow that there will be, um, uh, that we will put under the carpet the crimes that have been committed. In Nicaragua, in social media, we say, ni perdón, ni olvido. And it's what I said as well. There will be no forgetting, and there certainly will no forgiving unless these crimes are made accountable. When we look at the world today, I think, and we see around the atrocities that are being committed, 
whether we are talking about Yemen, whether we are talking about Syria, whether we are talking about so many other places and so many human rights violations. Perhaps Nicaragua is very small when we look at all the rest. But it is not small because if we don't do anything, if we don't speak up, it will become worse every day. Every day there will be victims. As a human rights defender who is thinking about Monday and when we will be celebrating the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and I look back and I think, have we made progress? We have made some progress, but it seems like the world has become indifferent, perhaps because there are so many atrocities that are being committed in the world, that everyone is overwhelmed and becomes indifferent. And perhaps we in Nicaragua, why is it that the media in the UK is so indifferent about what's happening in Nicaragua? I know we were not one of the colonies. And that Nicaragua is at the other side of the world. We are not in Africa or in Asia. We are in Latin America. And I hope that there was a time when Nicaragua was important for the British media, when Nicaragua was important to, for the media throughout the world. So why is it that it is not important today? I will tell you that I have more interviews that I do with French, German, American that I do with the British media. I'm not saying that the British people don't care. They've not been informed. And that's why it is so wonderful. And I'd like to thank again SOAS for allowing us to be here and to present to you another story, to present you the real story of what's happening in Nicaragua. And for us to be able to tell you, no, things are not normal in Nicaragua. That is what they would like to make us believe. People are being killed. People are being tortured. They are political prisoners. The media is being persecuted. The church is being persecuted. The poor farmers are being persecuted. The students and children are being killed. So thank you for being here. I really am very grateful that you have given us the opportunity and that you have come to listen to what we have to say. Thank you.